Okay, so the next uh, topic, the next axiom is about observables and operators. So, um, you know, what kind of experiments can we do? Okay, what are the observables? You know? Um, physical quantities that can be measured. Exactly. Yeah. What are the possible observables, right? Now, um, you know, in, from classical mechanics, we know that there's something called a position. And uh, there's also something called a momentum. And we know that this such, you know, um, you know, such things are going to be there in quantum mechanics as well, right? We know from some classical experiments like the, you know, um, um, I don't know, uh, like the Stern-Gerlach experiment. Although I have not uh, explained to you what the Stern-Gerlach experiment is, but you know, for example, the other experiment like Compton scattering. You know, there, there is momentum transformation and, uh, and then, you know, energy is another one. And then if you have momentum energy position, you're going to say, okay, there's going to be also probably angular momentum, okay? So these are the kind of observables that we have in classical physics and we also have them in quantum mechanics. Now, there are other observables in quantum mechanics which do not, we do not have in classical physics. And the most famous one of them is spin. Okay? Spin is analogous, it's analogous to, it's uh, analogous to angular momentum. It's a special type of angular momentum. But spin doesn't have any classical analog, okay? So, and you know, if you go to quantum field theory, there are even more sophisticated, more abstract kind of observables. Okay, so, you know, how do we mathematically uh, think of these observables? Well, we saw that uh, when we move, that something called an operator for position, there's a position operator, and it's a vector operator, meaning it has three components. And in the formulation that we are doing here, it's just given by the number x, the, the three, it's a, you know, x, y, and z. This is just a function. But when we looked at the momentum operator, <coughs> we saw that it was given by h bar by i, the gradient operator, right? And it acts on psi. Okay. And, but observables, you know, such as uh, energy, momentum, etc., you know, they are real numbers. And so somehow we have to extract real numbers from operators. So the most the canonical way or the more the standard way of doing this is to require, uh, you know, to do this, we, to do this, we require the operators to be self-adjoint. Then what happens is that the eigenvalues 
of the operator operators are real in that case. Okay. So, and then we can say, okay, suppose that our, you know, say that psi of x, um, psi of x of t is the state of the system. You know, then what we have is that we can say, okay, if I take O to be an observable and I ask you what is the average value of this, then uh, essentially what it'll be is that it'll be, you know, a sum over all the eigenvalues O of I. So O of, so, you know, this O of I are the eigenvalues. eigenvalues of O, meaning that, you know, if O acts on some wave function, psi I, X of T, then uh, you get these numbers times psi of X of T. So these are called eigenvalues and these are called eigenfunctions. So the expectation value of the operator in the state psi, and this state psi doesn't have to be its eigenfunction, uh, is going to be given by sum over, uh, okay. Um, uh, hang on, uh, let me, how should I say this? Let me put it in a slightly different way. Okay. Hang on. Mm. Yeah. So what it'll be is that it'll be sum over OI times the probability of OI. Okay. This is the expectation value of O. So this is by definition this thing, right? By definition, this is the average. But uh, what you want to know is that, you know, how is the dependence on psi in this case, right? So the, def so the way that this works is that we have also, def this is defined to be psi, the inner product with O acting on psi, okay? And this somehow magically becomes this thing, okay? So this is not obvious, how to go from here to here. Do you follow? Because on the left-hand side, there is a side dependence. On the right-hand side, we don't see any obvious dependence on side, right? It's actually going to be, there's a dependence here, but we want to figure that out. Okay, I just want to stop here and ask you if you appreciate what the problem is, what we're trying to figure out here. How did we write the last line? Like, how do we know that this they one? must... Yeah. This one? Uh, okay, sure. So this is essentially, you know, I am taking a shot in the dark, so to speak, but actually, no, I mean, there is motivation. So for example, you want to find the, the average position of a particle, right? That should be this thing, right? And you know that that should be given by the position, the, you know, if you, by the Born interpretation, it should be given by say, X of T squared. This is the density, right? The probability density. And then we have D cubed of X. So this is the probability of finding the particle in that small element, right? And then yeah. multiplied by X, right? So this is the average value by definition. Okay, Saif? Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, so, so this is just the generalization of that, right? 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, so, got it. so to go from this guy to you know this guy, what we have to appreciate is a few linear algebraic facts. And one of them is that if you have a Hermitian operator or a self-adjoint operator, if O is a self-adjoint operator, then in linear algebra, it's very easy to find out. In analysis, it's less easy. You know, then it's eigenfunctions now form a complete orthonormal orthonormal basis. Okay, so if I have psi i, these are the eigenfunctions of O, and I get small o i as the as the you know eigenvalues, then all these psi i's they will form an orthonormal basis. Meaning that if I take a psi i and a psi j and take its inner product, then I will be able to write it as delta i j. Okay. And if the i and j are it's it's a discrete if it's a discrete uh, index, not a continuous index then this equation will become this, okay? So this is a linear uh, an analysis, analysis slash linear algebra fact that we shall use. Okay, so, <clears throat> and you can, you know, you can actually prove this, okay? At least for the linear algebraic case, it's very easy to prove. And, you know, we will do that. In time. So if I do this, then what happens is that psi i, you know, it forms a basis. Forms a basis for your state space. And the state space has a name, it's called the Hilbert space. And so any state say the state that we are thinking about psi, it can be written as a linear combination of these guys, right? So we have ci, psi i. Okay, because they form a basis. Did you, do you see this? This is, this should be, you know, this falls from definition. Okay, so then if I now say, okay, I want to, I want to, uh, just one second. Uh, so, if I'm looking at the expectation value of some operator for the system in the state psi, then our definition is, you know, d cubed x r3, uh, say, psi star of x and t, and then O acting on, say, psi of x and t. Now, if I look at this part, O acting on psi of x and t is O acting on, if I decomp decompose this in terms of this, guy, I had ci, psi i, x of t, right? And then what I will see is that this thing will go inside and act on this, and then what I'll get is that ci, the eigenvalue o i, psi i x of t. Now, if I put this expression back here, 
what I will get is expectation value of O with respect to psi. And now I can also express this thing as a sum. So I will have two sums, I and J, and then an integral, D cubed of X, R3, and then I will have uh, CI star, and then from here I will get CJ, and then I will have O of J, and I will have Psi I star, Psi J. And then I can factor out I J, uh, C I and C J do not depend on X, so I can factor them out. O is just a eigenvalue, I can also factor that out. So I get O of J and then inside uh, the integral, what we have is Psi I, Psi J. But According to our assumption, this is delta ij. So I can use this delta ij to do one of these sums. Say I do the sum over j. And if I do the sum over j, then I get c of i norm squared and then oj. So now if I identify this as my probability of getting the value i, then we get that this is equal to I, O I, which is exactly the expression that we get. Okay. So the coefficient of linear combination that becomes, if I, you know, according to the Born interpretation that should be interpreted as the probability of coming up with the eigenvalue I. OI. Okay. So to recap the expectation value of an observable in a state psi is given by the sum over the probability of coming up with the uh, eigenvalue OI times the eigenvalue itself, where the probability I is defined as uh, the coefficient ci squared, where ci squared is defined as, uh, just one second, okay. Okay, sorry about that. So psi is sum over i, ci, psi i, these are eigenfunctions. of the operator O. Okay, so what is the corollary? Corollary is that if psi is in an eigenstate psi i and you observe O, what is going to be the result of that observation? Here in that case, ci is one, right? So what is the what is the what is the result of this observation? Can someone tell me? So what are the what are the okay we have got an observable O? The IS eigenvalue? Yeah, so it'll be O I. Right, so we have an observable O, right? And uh, we have um, OI, the, the observable, and the probability of getting OI, right? So um, I don't know if I drew a graph, but you know, if, if my wave function is psi I, then you know, the observable that I get OI is one, right? Sorry, I should not have drawn a graph, but um, 